Hi, uh, my name is Laura Cathcart Robbins, and as Scott said, this is on my nightstand. And today we're bringing you the season finale for um, season 11. For on my nightstand, it's called Dare to Defy, the autobiography of Peter Champole Ole La Roca. Um, this is his autobiography, and he was um, actually presented to us by his granddaughter a few months ago, and we just fell in love with his story. So I've been waiting for a chance to read it to you. Uh, a little bit about the book and Mr. Champole Ole La Roca. Dare to Defy captures the efforts of an individual in Africa as he breaks the constraints of ethnic traditions and carves a path for himself in a fast-changing world. So I will be reading from um, chapter one, which is called An Only Child. Chapter one, An Only Child. I was born in 1935 or 1936, at the end of a great famine which spread all over Maasai land. The exact date, time, and year is not known to me. My parents did not count the days, months, and years as we do now. They were illiterate, so like many other pre-colonial communities in Africa, my parents relied on ecological events to help them mark time. Traditionally, the Maasai people have 12 months in their calendar year. This is similar to the modern calendar, which is broken into 12 months, with each month having between 28 and 31 days. But for the Maasai people, every month has exactly 30 days. The 30 days were then divided into two categories, 15 days of light and 15 days of darkness. My father, the Roca Ole Kesempe Lusimpen, told me I was born after the Great Famine, which decimated nearly all the cattle, sheep, and goats in all parts of Maasai land. The drought, which was so severe that even donkeys were not spared, a thing which is not considered normal in Maasai history. The drought was christened Alemelu Loik, the famine of bones. It was the greatest famine, with skeletons in abundance. The Maasai were forced to cook and eat the hide of dead animals. That famine did not spare the Kikiyu people either. My father told me that when they visited Kikiyu land in search, search of food, they found the curious spectacle of people boiling banana stems to trick their children into falling asleep as they waited for quote-unquote food to get ready. My father told me that after visiting several places in search of food, God brought something else. The white people came, and they bought bones of dead animals, including wildlife. The trade became famous and incorporated the young and the old who traveled all places in search of bones. The trade became famous and incorporated the young and the old who traversed all places in search of bones, which they sold to the white men. That is why it was called the famine of bones. Everyone was living on money earned from selling bones. I don't know whether the currency in use was the traditional cowrie shells or the rupee, which came to our land through the white man but which was, in fact, fashioned in India well before the 19th century, which is when it gained popularity in the British colonies, like Kenya. It is said that the white men make cups from these bones. The Maasai never brought these cups because they suspected that some bones of those were made from human beings. The bones were sold to a company from Tanganyika called Libis that later changed its name to Kenyan Meat Commission, KMC. My father told me that while they collected bones and carried them on foot through paths into the wilderness to Mavako to the Ati River, there were no demarcated roads and no vehicles to transport them, so they trekked on paths the people had mastered over the years. Those who survived the famine were those who ran away to join other tribes with farming skills. The farmers were lucky since they planted drought-resistant crops such as cassava and yams. The Maasai, who fled away from their tribal land to join farming communities, learned methods of farming, and when they returned, they introduced farming activities. That is how farming at Incurment Encartment came to being. Immediately after my birth, I was given a temporary name. That is what happened with all newborn children in my community. The temporary name is used until the family meets and decides 
when to give the child a permanent name. One evening, I guess when all the cattle and sheep and goats had been enclosed, my family met and proposed two names before settling on Tumpes, meaning a polite, rich person. There followed the necessary rites that went along with naming. Given the prevailing traditions of the time, my father must have said the following words to bless me. Grow up fully to manhood. Grow and be like Mr. Kenya and Kilimanjaro. Be helpful to your father and mother. Be of help to your nation. Help the cattle of the my people. When my mother died, my father vowed never to marry again. He detested the behavior of many stepmothers who normally mistreated their stepchildren, and, given his enormous love for me, he didn't want to run the risk of ending up with an unkind second wife. My father defied all the traditions of his time. He took on all the responsibilities that a mother would have taken on for her child. He was in charge of the house and all its chores. He used to go out and fetch firewood and water. He also cooked and washed the utensils. He would sweep the house in the morning before everything else was done. Then he went out to milk our cows, brought the milk, lit the fire, and made tea for both of us. When the cows were ready to go for grazing, he separated the calves from the cattle. The calves were left behind to graze around the homestead, while the mature cows went the long distance in search of fat, fresh pastures. The same happened with the sheep and the goats. The kids were left at home while the big ones were driven away for grazing. That was the order of, ev of the day, every day. My father had to combine the role of looking after the animals with that of doing the housework. Every time he moved to a new place, my father had to construct a new house. My father had no alternative but to break with cultural norms and face his reality squarely. Among the Maasai, houses are built by women, so sometimes women laughed at him. But that did not seem to worry him at all. There were also some kind women, ones who assisted him by showing him how to curve the thin sticks that support the hut in order to make a well-shaped structure. Back then, we didn't wear the kind of clothes that we have today. We wore refined goat or sheep hides. This was a soft skin made round at the shoulders like a petticoat, but with, with no buttons to fasten it. The backside covered from the shoulders down to the buttocks only. The front side, chest and stomach, was naked and exposed to the cold or heat, depending on the weather of the day. My father fed me, just as a mother would, and he was good at it. My main diet was milk. He made sure that I drunk one calabash three times a day before I went out to meet my age mates. I had to consume about a half a liter of fresh milk in the morning, another similar amount during lunch hours, and again in the evening for supper. This was done the whole year, from January to December. The portion was, however, increased as I grew up. The milk was never boiled. It was obtained from the cattle when it was still warm. I took so much milk that there was not much difference between me and the calves. We all passed whitish liquid stool. I was made to understand that this was a sign of good health. I grew fat and stout. My body was round and I looked like a stuffed doll. This was a sign of good health because in every home that I visited with my father, people were impressed and they marveled at my well-built body. The Maasai believe that if one marvels at somebody's child, he has to spit at least a little saliva on the child's face as a sign of good faith and blessing, and so my father would force those who marveled at me to spit a little saliva on my face so as to protect me from any misfortune. The bat once spat a lot of saliva or even coughed out their sputum on me. Later, at Kirasan, I encountered a woman called Naya Kanjo. Whenever she looked at a child or a stranger and admired him or her, that person became sick. Ironically, the woman was invited to treat those affected by this bad omen. If parents wanted to take their children on tours, they invited Naya Kanjo to perform her curative and protective rituals before the trips were made.